Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. I hope you're keeping well, you're staying safe and healthy. We are big, bad and back for another Frequently Asked Questions. Fact Friday, here we come. So I feel truly blessed. I am lucky, I work very close to my house, it's walking distance away. So my life over the last two weeks hasn't really been that massively affected by all of the isolation that we're all going through at the moment. So let us know how you're dealing with everything. Wherever you are in the world, please leave some comments and questions below. Let's keep this super positive though and talk about all of the amazing things that we've been able to share between us over the last couple of weeks. We put up four full courses for you to download. We did one with Brad Wood, which was just amazing, and I also mixed the song as well. We did one with Tony Franklin, talking about bass production, recording ideas, bass recording. We did one with Matt Starr, talking about drum production and drum recording. And there's one, of course, with me, that's mixed from scratch. And you see me changing my mind and giving you the reasons why I'm doing what I do. And that was a lot of fun to do, and I really feel blessed that I was able to share it with you all. Don't forget, we're doing a 30-day free membership to the Academy. You can sign up for 30 days for free. And while you're in there, you can go into the forums and you can put your mixes in there. So if you wanna mix these multi-tracks, go in there and people will help you. What is incredible about this amazing community we have here is everybody helps each other. So please sign up for that. That would be amazing to see you in there. Of course, you can go to producelikeapro.com and just sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. If you subscribe down here, please also hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when we have new videos. And thank you ever so much for being an incredible community and uh, let's get on with some questions. I wonder, when is it time to get a manager? And what is a manager doing for mixing engineers? Is it a possibility to reach out to the bigger bands and get new challenges? Are there managers that are looking for mixing engineers and who can help bring you to mix off competitions and stuff? I can't remember when I got my first manager in America. I believe it was very late 90s, early 2000s. And the first guy that managed me was Gary Gunton. And Gary also managed Dave Jordan, Brian Kallstrom, and Mark Endert. Three guys that I really, really admired. And when he started working with me, it was really really fantastic. I would already was working with Dave Jordan and Brian Kallstrom, and then I got to meet Mark Endert, and I remember one of the first big records I got involved in, in America, was the phrase first record, and I recommended Mark for the job, and Mark mixed that album, and the rest is history. He did an amazing job on the mix, and the album did exceptionally well. So it was a big deal, me getting that manager, but I don't know if managers are necessarily getting me the work or getting anybody the work, but they are definitely really good at building relationships. I still have to get the work to a certain extent. What I mean is my manager, who is amazing, will connect with me with people, but they don't just hand you a gig and say, here's an album to mix. You know, there was a time maybe when the people were banging down the doors looking for anybody of a high quality to be available, but those days are long gone for anybody, even the biggest names that you can think of. Andrew Shep said a couple of years ago he was only working three months a year on major label projects. So in between that, he was doing independent work or doing work on passion project projects, things that he really loved. And I think that's pretty typical of most mixers, producers, and engineers. I do, well, over the last year or two, we've done three Rick Springfield albums, a couple of Ace Freely albums, worked with a bunch of independent artists. Uh, we have one artist we're working with at the moment who's phenomenal, who we've been developing and doing great work. And in between that, we're doing tons and tons of indie projects. That's really our business now. It's all about working on independent stuff and la major label and bigger artists slotted in between. There's very few people, probably Serban, Spike, you know, that are working solidly. I think Mark Endert's working solidly on pop from all over the world, but that's there's a handful of people who are working solidly in their genre. Most are moving in and out of doing different projects of different levels. The, the days of major label work 
for everybody has gone. And, and that's okay. I like getting in the trenches and really, you know, creating work, interacting with artists, listening to demos, listening to mixes, listening to, you know, roughs of acoustic guitar vocal songs. I, I, yesterday I was listening to three or four songs from an artist that I'm about to work with um, that were very basic demos. To me, it's really important to understand that this is a different world. A manager, a great manager like I have, Bennett Kaufman and Mike Carto, uh, who works with him, is uh, both absolutely phenomenal people. They are able to direct resources. They're able to help out doing contracts, give great advice, and also introduce me to people when I need to be introduced. But any manager, it doesn't matter who it is, is not fielding thousands and thousands of gigs and then deciding who to give them to. It's a very, very different world, and that is okay. A great manager will guide you in a way that is just unbelievable. And they're worth their weight in gold. They really are. There's lots of really good managers out there, but it's probably difficult if you don't have much going on for them to figure out how to bring you to the fold. You do need to generate and create not only your own business, but generate and create your own buzz. You know, do something great. Find an independent band, work with them, and make some great music with them. Then take it to a manager and say, can you help me shop this for a record deal? That will get you a manager, and that will get your band a record deal, and that will put you on the map. Really, developing artists is a huge way to get your career going. The old way of going to assist at a studio, then become the engineer, then become the producer, is shrunk down to a handful of people. Most of the guys and girls I know that are successful at the moment did it the way I did it, which is to find artists, develop them, and get them signed. So do that, and then start contacting the best managers in the business and send them music and send them an email, send them an MP3 or two and say, here's a band, here's an artist I've worked with, this is something I've developed, let me know what you think, do you think you'd be able to help me get a record deal for the artist? Do that. Do the same thing with large lawyers, you know, get, get the wheels going, but make sure it's good. Don't waste your time and energy just sending some generic band that's okay. Get involved with something, make it amazing, put your heart and your soul in there, and do everything you possibly can to elevate it and bring it to the next level. And as they grow, your reputation will grow with them, and your career will grow with them. I have developed and got numerous amounts of artists signed, and some of them you know quite well. So that is what I 100% suggest that you do. A manager will come when you need it, and when you have something enough going on that they can help you and help elevate you. Like I say, the best managers, and I'm lucky to have a great one, did that, but I already had a lot of career stuff going that they were able to help develop. And I think it's all part and parcel of it, really having a very, very successful relationship with people. And they will help nurture those for you. I'm looking to upgrade my interface and add tons of microphones to my mic locker. With all the different options out there, how do I know I'm getting the right ones for me? Does it matter? If you're going to upgrade your interface and your microphones, great, all power to you. If your interface is 10, 15, 20 years old, which many of us still have, I have an old Mbox. Yeah, the, the interfaces that are out these days, like the Audience and, and the UAD stuff, for instance, both of which we use here, are incredible. The quality I can get from an Audience interface or a UAD in interface is just next level compared with what I was doing when I was using a Digi 001 in the late 90s, early 2000s. Trust me, I did records that did well on those. I did overdubs on plenty of stuff with them. But when I hear the quality I get now, a fraction of the cost and goodness knows how much better quality. So definitely, if you're talking about upgrading from an old interface that's 15 plus years old, don't even, I'm not even going to argue with that. Do it. You're going to hear a massive difference. Secondly, of course, if you want to upgrade the amount of inputs, you might only have a two input and you need a four or an eight or a 16. I get that. If you're going to start recording live drums or bands or live recordings, you're going to need eight or 16 inputs. Totally relate to that as well. So all of those are very valid things. Now, with microphones, that's a massive discussion. I did a video a couple of years ago, a year or two ago, where I took Shure microphones, who are not sponsoring this, by the way. 
Hi, Shaw, if you're watching. But I took Shaw microphones and an Audient interface and shot it out against 150 grand's worth of beautiful microphones through Sunset Sound's incredible console and record it onto Pro Tools HDX. So we did like a, you know, a comparison. We were able to record the band like that, the drums in particular. It was $1,700 for all the microphones and the interfaces. There was two interfaces and the microphones total 1700 bucks. And we estimated about half, about half a million dollars worth in gear between probably more, the beautiful Sunset Sound console, 150 grand's worth of mics, HDX, you know, at least half a million. So massive difference in price, but with the same room and the same drum kit being played at the same time, mics were taped together. And was there a difference? Yeah, there was a difference. Was I able to mix them and both make them sound absolutely amazing? Yeah. That's the reality. The difference was negligible. It existed. There was moments you're like, hmm, there's a little bit more body in that $15,000 Neumann. Of course there is. It's a $15,000 Neumann. It's tube. It's adding all this stuff. But I'll tell you what. Remember those, Eric, remember those lollipop shores? They're like a little lollipop mic. We put those on the ground next to, I think, a pair of 87s. There'll be a link to the video you can check out. I swear blind they sounded better. Quite a few people said that the, the low room mics, the cheap ones, I think they're $99 each, these microphones, sounded better than I believe it was a pair of U87s. It just, the point is, is like, does a, was a U87 a better microphone? Of course it is, probably in 90% of the, uh, of the situations. But the point is, is like this $100 microphone as a room mic was unbelievable. So my long answer to your question is, is, is like, yes, you can fill out your mic locker and you can be smart about it. You can get yourself a, a decent mid-price large diaphragm vocal microphone, and then you can save a fortune on more inexpensive microphones for drums, dynamic microphones. And as we all know, there's a lot of incredible companies. Companies like Shaw, companies like Lewitt, companies like Audio-Technica. There's a lot of companies. And then, you know, there's some of the really inexpensive MXL microphones that do great things. There's a lot of really good SC Electronics. There are so many options now for a fraction of a cost. So with all this in mind, this is the reason why we are not being sponsored by, but actually sponsor Audio Test Kitchen. If you go to Audio Test Kitchen's site, you'll see it says sponsored by Produce Like a Pro and Sound on Sound. What does that mean? That means that there's no money changing hands. It means that we believe in what they're doing because they're helping people. They're truly helping people. So, like I said, I'm not paying them, they're not paying me. It's just a really freaking good idea. And what is it doing? It is helping. Should I say that one more time? Helping. Go to the website and play back drums with different microphones and hear all the options. And no matter what your budget is, if you've got $5,000 or $500, you will find microphones in plural. Plural. $500, there's some great $100 microphones out there. Go look at them. Go find them. Go and find some inexpensive microphones. If you want a pair of inexpensive condensers as room mics or overheads or stereo pianos, you can do it for a few hundred dollars. Is it gonna be a pair of U67s? Heck no, but is it gonna be close enough and with a nice sounding instrument played by a good performer, record quality? Yes, guarantee it. Let's not forget some of the best microphones in the world that are used every day are not expensive. Doesn't matter how you look at it, an SM57 is a preferred guitar amplifier mic, it is a preferred snare microphone, and people I know sing into it, famous singers sing into it. And you can get them anywhere from like 100-ish to like $79, depending on where the Guitar Center is having a sale. It's usually about a $99 microphone. So if it's a lead vocal mic for people like Bono and Mick Jagger on many occasions, and the best or the most popular guitar amp mic and the most popular snare drum mic, you get my point. It's not always about spending money. Now also equally, you also get what you pay for in quite a lot of instances when it comes to spending money. If you wanna go in and get something like, totally equal opportunity here, not talking about any one mic manufacturer, but you know, think about Ivana Manley's reference mic. It's like a fairly expensive vocal mic, but it is phenomenal sounding. It's built like a brick schnizzle house, it will last forever, and it gives you cachet. 
If you buy an 87, same thing, brings you cachet. You, there's so much more to buying microphones than just price, then it's, it, there's, there's a lot to it. If you walk into somebody's studio and they have 20 or 30 microphones to mic up a band, but they have like one really nice vocal mic, maybe one nice ribbon, handful of 57s, and then maybe 10, 10 or 15 microphones from Lewitt, Audio Technica, MXL, nobody's gonna blink. Nobody's gonna think that you don't know what you're doing. It's all about being selective when it comes to microphone choices. So once more, go to Audio Test Kitchen, go and listen to all of the different variety of microphones in there, and you will, you will experience a lot of stuff. Some of them are very, very close, despite price range, and some of them are quite different. But if anything, I think one of the things that it does is it tells people it's okay. It's okay. If you've only got $100 to spend on a microphone, there's good microphones for 100 bucks. If you've got $5,000 to spend on a microphone, you'll find a really nice mic for $5,000. You get my point. Go in there with a budget in mind of what you could spend and then go and test them yourselves and realize, quite frankly, that you can do a great job with all manufacturers have different price points and different products that will work. Neumann themselves have amazing microphones. The TLM range are phenomenal. So you could buy a Neumann product for a fraction of the cost of their high-end stuff. There's so many options. Go to Audio Test Kitchen, try it out. As far as your interface is concerned, yes, upgrade it. If it's 15, 20 years old, you're gonna hear a difference and you're gonna appreciate a difference. And you're gonna get more flexibility and frankly, you'll get so much more bang for your buck. Um, there is wonderful, wonderful interfaces out there for a fraction of the cost. How would you recommend getting the right mic position while you're recording yourself? If I'm recording myself, I'm probably using headphones or I'm sitting between speakers. It depends on what you mean. If, if it's acoustic guitar or vocals, it's a no-brainer because I'm singing into the mic. So, you know, I can move the mic around. It might be, might be booming here and just about too distant there, but oh, here it is, sounds great. That's easy, it's recording acoustic guitar, strum those chords, move the mic, get it away from the sound hole, put it more on the strings, put it on the bottom of the body, all those different positions to get a really good tone. Absolutely amazing. So that's gonna be easy because you're wearing a pair of headphones and you can get it to place. But if you're talking about things like, well, even pianos, piano, microphones in front of you, you know, you can lean over even in a grand piano and move a mic slightly and then play some chords and then move it, no problem. Uprights, microphones there, move the mic. These are all easy situations. I think the only time you might struggle a little bit is with electric guitar. Uh, especially if you've got an amp that you're cranking for the tone, you're driving the power amp really hard. That's where it might start to become a bit of a pain. Totally understand if, you, if you're in that situation where you're moving things around, you know, and it's super, super loud. I would try the mic Plotnikov trick and sort of follow the hiss you know, have the amp completely open without the guitar plugged in and see if you can hear the difference between the, the outside going and the inside going and find a sweet spot, go and play it, play some chords, record them if you like, listen back, move the microphone, maybe try two or three different positions from the dust cap to the outside of the, of the driver and maybe move it in and out, maybe do three different positions and then go back and listen to them. There's all kinds of fun things. And if you're not sure, if it's a four by 12, try a different speaker. Most of us have cabs where we have a favorite speaker. In my cab, I think it has two, vintage, what is it? It's, it's a mismatch of vintage 30s and original 30s, I think. Actually, no, isn't it original 25 in there? It's a real hodgepodge of, of speakers. The impedances match, but the speakers are all different. There is speakers that sound better than others. And that's just sort of the way it is. So don't be afraid to record some different speakers. Don't be afraid when you're using an open back cab to mic on the back as well, exactly opposite, and flip the phase, reverse the polarity on the back one, and then blend the two together. And again, record two or three different takes in different positions, and then compare. It's difficult. If it's super, super loud, you can go in there with a pair of headphones on and strum chords. Unless you've got amazing sounding isolation headphones, it can be difficult. But if you do have amazing sounding isolation headphones, then you can just go in the room with the amp and play chords and move the mics around. I hope that helps. Thank you ever so much for so many incredible questions. Please stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. Leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. This is where we get our frequently asked questions, Friday's questions from. Easy for me to say. This is where they come from, so leave them down below. 
Don't forget, you can try out a 30-day free trial of the Academy at the moment. So for those of you that are forced to be isolated, you can go in there for 30 days and try it out and just meet all the incredible people in the community, share mixes, um, get advice, and just generally have a great time. Thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being incredible members of our community and have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Mm -hmm.